Good morning and a very warm welcome to Heronbridge Community Church. This morning we will start off with our Heron Kids talk and Megan will be telling us the story of Miriam and how she saved her little brother Moses. Then our main service will start at 9 o'clock, that's in 15 minutes. Enjoy the morning with us. Good morning everybody and welcome to Sunday School. I hope you have all had a super duper weekend and are ready for what God has to teach us today. So before we begin, let's put our hands together and shut our eyes. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we can come together even though we can't be physically together. I pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive the message that you have planned for us today. We ask this in, we ask this in your precious name. Amen. Okay, guys, so this month is Women's Month, and that means we are celebrating women. So we are going to be talking about someone in the Bible, a woman in the Bible, who played a very important role in Moses' life. So we are going to be learning all about a lady named Miriam today, and she was the sister of Moses. Now we all know about Moses' story, but we don't know about Miriam and what an important role she played in his life. So I'm going to read you a bit of a story today, and we're going to learn a little bit more about Miriam and why she was so important. So a long time ago, when the Hebrew people lived in Egypt, they were very, very unhappy. They were slaves to the Egyptians and had to work very, very hard. The Pharaoh worried because he saw that every year there were more and more Hebrews. He thought that one day they might rise up against the Egyptians and win. So he ordered the Hebrew midwives, who helped the Hebrew mothers while they were giving birth, to kill all of the Hebrew baby boys. Now Miriam lived with her parents and her older brother Aaron in the land of Egypt. Her people were Hebrew slaves, and she had heard about the news or well, the new laws of the Pharaoh, and she was very scared, because she knew that her mother was about to have a baby soon. When the baby boy was born, Moses, Miriam and her family tried to keep the baby's arrival a big secret. Aaron and Miriam would watch the road, and if there were any soldiers coming, they would begin to sing and play so loudly that the soldiers wouldn't be able to hear the baby. Miriam would watch for the soldiers as well while her mom took the baby to the bath, to the river, so that she could bath him. As Moses grew, Miriam and her mom knew that they weren't going to be able to keep him a secret for much longer and keep him hidden and safe. So her mom came up with a very daring and clever plan. They made a basket to hold the baby, and then they hid Moses in that basket in the tall grasses in the river. And it was Miriam's job to watch out for her baby brother and stand in guard. It was very hot, and Miriam felt very, very scared. She wasn't sure what was going to happen. A little while later, the Pharaoh's daughter went down to the river to have a bath, and she saw this basket in the reeds. So she sent a slave girl to fetch it. When she opened the basket, she saw Moses and she immediately fell in love with him and she decided to keep him and raise her as her own. Now Miriam, who was standing in the bushes and watching what was happening, was feeling very scared, but she bravely stepped forward and offered to, uh, offered to find a Hebrew woman to help nurse the baby for the Pharaoh's daughter. So the Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, please, that would be great. And Miriam ran to tell her mother, and Moses' very own mom was then brought in to take care of him and nurse him until he was weaned. Wow, can you imagine how difficult and scary that must have been for Miriam? She had no idea what was going to happen to her baby brother, if he was going to be found and killed, or if the basket would be able to float. I can't imagine what she must have been feeling. She was probably very, very frightened. And she also didn't know what was going to happen when she came forward to the Pharaoh's daughter and offered help. She might have gotten into, into trouble, or who knows? So she must have been very scared, and it was a very difficult time for her. Now, we may not experience the exact same difficulties in life that Miriam did, but we do also still experience our own difficulties, and we may sometimes feel very scared and overwhelmed and not know what to do. So... I want us to think of some of the difficulties that we might face at the moment, especially right now. I can think of a few. 
I can think of the fact that schools are being closed and that we're having to get used to a different way of learning. We're having to get used to learning through a computer. We're feeling a bit scared about the coronavirus. We don't know what's going to happen, when it's going to get better, and we're just feeling unsure about what is going to happen going forward. So how do these things make us feel? I can, I can imagine that they make us feel scared. They can make us feel sad. They can make us feel anxious. So looking at what we're facing and the difficulties we're facing, what can we learn from Miriam and her story that can help us when we are facing difficult times? Well, I think that this story tells us that even when times are really hard and we are facing very, very difficult situations, we can remember that God is always, always with us and he can help us to be brave. We can call on him no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what frightening things we might be facing, and he will be there to help us to be brave, just like Miriam was when she was standing and watching over baby Moses. I'm sure she asked God for help and he definitely provided it because look what happened to Moses. He went on to be a very, very important person in the Bible. So what I would like for us to do today is I would like you to get a jar, any kind of jar. It can be a coffee jar or an empty jam jar. And I would like you to decorate it any way you want. You can use paper or pens or glue, or whatever you can find to decorate this jar. And we are going to make what we're going to call a worry jar. Now this worry jar, you're going to keep at home with you. And whenever you are feeling worried about something or scared about something or unsure, or you just feel like you're needing some help, you are going to write down what you're feeling worried about. If you can't write, you can ask your moms or your dads to help you write it down. And you're going to put this into the jar. And this is going to be like giving our worries to God, giving them to him and asking him to help us with them, no matter what they will be and knowing that we have released it. So we don't have to feel that fear and anxiousness about those things. We give them up to God and we know that he will help us no matter what, just like he did with Miriam. Okay, everyone, I hope that you have learned something from the story. I know I definitely have, and I'm going to make my own worry jar. So I'd like us to just say a prayer in closing and um, then we're going to sing a song afterwards. Lord, we thank you so much that you are always, always with, with us. We thank you that we can come to you no matter what we're going through and that you will be there to help us be brave, just like you were there to help Miriam be brave as she watched over baby Jesus. Lord, be with us over the next, our whole lives, be with us through our whole lives and help us to remember that we can always come to you no matter what. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Amen. Right, everyone, enjoy the song that's coming up next, and then we'll see you soon. Bye. I lay my life down at your feet. You're the only one I need. Turn to you. Troubled times, it's you I seek. Put you first, that's all I need. Humble all I am, all to you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. You were always, always there, every how and everywhere. Your grace abounds so deeply within me. You will never, ever change. Yesterday, today, the same. Forever till forever meets no end. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. 
one way Jesus you're the only one that I could live for you are the way the truth and the life we live by faith and not by sight for you we live in all for you you are the way the truth and the life we live by faith and not by sight for you we live in
Good morning, Heronbridge Community Church. My name is Janique van der Merwe, and welcome to our service. I just have a quick scripture to read to you today from Isaiah 43, verse 19, and it reads, See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And I just want to encourage you with this this morning that God is with us. And as spring is upon us, we can know that God is with us and change is coming. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that all good gifts come from you, God. And so we take every blessing this morning that you have poured out, God, and we want to turn it to praise. We pray that you would bless our service this morning. I pray that you would be with Jane as she speaks, God. I pray, Father, that you would just be with us so that we would know that our God is good and he is a present help. We worship you with everything that we are. We thank Thank you, God, for your goodness. All these things in your name. Amen. Please enjoy the service. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. 
Let us pray together. Father, we come together this morning as your children, and we do so with joyful hearts. And Father, we do declare this morning as one that blessed be your name. And Lord, thank you for the blessing that we can experience, the blessings we look forward to because of your blessed name. Lord, thank you that we are your children, that we've been called into your perfect light. Lord, we are part of your family. And what a joy and what a blessing that is this morning as we come together to worship you, to, to sing together, to hear your word, and to come together as the body of Christ today. Father, we just thank you for our church. I thank you for every member of our congregation. And Lord, I pray that right now in, in the midst of whatever people are facing, Lord, hardship, difficulties, struggles, uh, people who have lost loved ones, people who have lost income. Father, I pray that you would meet every single person, every member of this congregation, every person watching this service today, Lord, that you would meet them at their point of need. Lord, that every single one of us would know without a doubt that we are in the palm of your hands and that we are loved by you. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. Thank you that no matter what we're facing, Lord, we know that you are with us and that you have a plan and a purpose for every single one of us. And so, Father, we commit this service to you this morning. We commit our time together to you, Lord. Pray that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, Lord. Strengthen us, equip us, guide us, Lord, and use us for your purposes and for your glory. We praise you, Lord, and we love you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a very good morning to each and every one of you. It's wonderful that you can join us uh, this morning, the 16th of August, halfway through August. Spring is just around the corner. Uh, just a few announcements that I'd like to bring to your attention this morning. First of all, uh, this is quite important because this is the last reminder, your last chance to sign up for the marriage course, which is starting next Wednesday, the 19th of August at 7 p.m. The course runs for about an hour and a half to two hours. It's absolutely free of charge, but we do need people to let us know that they are going to be joining it because we need to uh, get materials to you in advance. Now, in terms of the format of this course, it really is very casual, very relaxed, very laid back. It's just you and your significant other, your spouse. That is a requirement for this course. You have to be married. Um, you and your spouse, your husband or your wife, uh, you will sit down together in the intimacy and the privacy of your own home and you will go through the material together. It's a video you watch for a while. They ask you to stop, you discuss a few things, you do some exercises, you watch a bit more. That's the format of the course. Uh, so we'd really, really like to encourage you to, to sign up for the marriage course. It's not only if your marriage is in trouble, it's for all marriages. Uh, and it really is a valuable and a good tool. And we really would encourage as many of our married couples in the church as possible to sign up and to be part of this course on a Wednesday evening starting next Wednesday. Then coming up in September, we have our next online, our Zoom or Zelfa coming up, Zoom Alpha. Uh, that will start on Saturday, uh, sorry, Wednesday, the 3rd of September at 7 p.m. And it will be run by some youngsters, Dylan and Joel. They're hip and happening. So it's going to be an exciting course. And the challenge really is uh, to you, the viewers, our congregation, who are you going to invite to this online alpha? It can't happen if people don't come, if people aren't invited. And it really is very simple. It's as simple as that. Invite a friend a colleague, a family member, somebody who is maybe they've been a Christian for a long time but have questions, somebody who is seeking someone who is not a, a Christian. It is non-threatening. Once again, it's in the privacy of one's home and it really is a non-threatening way to go deeper and explore some of the fundamental issues of what we believe as Christians. So that's our Alpha coming up on the 3rd of September. And then just a reminder, kind of advance notice, uh, every year we have an annual general meeting. Uh, things aren't any different now, just because we're in lockdown, we still need to and will have our AGM. That's coming up on Sunday, the 6th of September, and it will happen at 10.30. In other words, immediately after the service that morning, 
uh, just a reminder to to block that time out. Don't uh, organize to have something on else something else on after church, but join us for the AGM. It will start at 10:30 on the 6th of September. Friends, we uh, we have a slot in our services generally, and we we really trying to get into the routine of doing that again, just where we acknowledge the goodness of God. Uh, and today it will be the turn of Chris Liebenberg, who's going to share with us. But just to say to you, if you want to share just what God has done, what God has shown you, what God has taught you, something that you've experienced that gives glory to God, put it down on a video, record yourself, send it through to, to Trish at the church, and uh, we'll put it up. So really, we want to encourage as many people just to share what God has been doing in their lives. Let's hear what Chris has to say. Hi, guys. I need to share with you three amazing answers to prayer. Uh, the three big issues in my life this year have been uh, very low income because I've lost a good tenant through COVID-19. Uh, I've run up a huge amount of debt because I've had to buy hardware, uh, hardware materials on credit uh, to fix a flat that I'm uh, getting ready. And then the other thing that would help is if I could sell the combi and trailer, which presents a huge problem because it's registered in the name of a non-existent organization now. So on Tuesday morning last, I was praying and the phone rang. I answered it and the man said, I would like to buy your combi and trailer. I was surprised and overjoyed that it came in the midst of the prayer for what I was praying for. So he agreed to come the next day. And the next day, Wednesday, I phoned Chris Jackson and said, please pray fervently. Uh, there's a chance I could sell the combi and get rid of all my debt. I have no doubt that Chris prayed. The man arrived at 11.30 with his wife. They looked it over and they said, yes, they would like to buy it. So the deal was struck and midnight on Wednesday night, the money came through and I immediately transferred to my credit card, which was very overdrawn. So my debt was canceled. And then just to add the cherry on top, the Lord made an agent phone me the next day, Friday, to say that she'd found a tenant for my cottage that's reliable and has passed all the credit checks. So in three days, my three biggest issues were just wiped clean. Um, the atheist will say it's all coincidence, but I think we know better. So all praise and uh, thanks to our Heavenly Father and thanks for your prayers. Ciao now. So we particularly like to pray for Gail and for her family. She has two lovely sons, Marco and Michele, and we'd like to pray for them and uh, also for the grandchildren, little Jamie and Jordan, and for the whole family, that there's just a love and unity and understanding and caring between them all. And most importantly, that they walk a, a road with you, with, with God. So that's what we'd like to pray for. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, we thank you for Gail and we thank you for the incredible person that she is. Thank you for her huge heart, so caring and loving always to everybody. We know that she's a good servant of yours, Lord, and that you really, really smile on her for her goodness. We thank you for keeping her safe over this strange time we've been through. Thank you for keeping her smiling. And we pray, Lord, that all of this continues, her love and her caring, and that she gets, that you bless her for it. We pray that uh, you particularly look after her family, her two sons, Marco and Michele, and their families. For the gorgeous little grandchildren, we thank you for them, for Jamie and for Jordan, and we pray that you bless them, Lord. We pray that all of them grow up knowing you and being very close to you. And we pray, Lord, that your fruits of your spirit that you teach us just flow through this family, that there's love and peace, peace and patience, kindness, understanding, gentleness, that you keep this, this love flowing through them all and that the relationship through this family will be good and wholesome. We just pray, Lord, that you stay close to Gail and you know her needs, Lord. 
Uh, we always pray for her to be safe and for her health to be well. And you know, Lord, you, you know her needs and we pray that you do look after her in all of these things. So we thank you and we pray in your precious name, dear Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. As we consider the offering this morning, let us turn our attention to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. We have so much to be thankful for, and many of us are rich in this world. Let us really use our riches to serve the kingdom of God. All the things that God has given us, all the good deeds, all the good things that he has given us. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for all that you have given us, for the way in which you have made us rich by your love, by your grace, by all the things that you have done for us. You have given us life. So, Lord, we ask that we might be able to share that, share it with others in this world. We ask that you would pray. We pray for the church this morning and ask that you would help the leaders of this church to use the, the gifts that have been given wisely, that they may be used for your service and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Friends, uh, today is the third week uh, in our series for Women's Month, uh, which we are calling Her Story, where we are looking at how God has spoken through women in the Bible. You know, we know that the Bible was written in a very patriarchal, patriarchal and hierarchical society. And, and it tends, the weight of the Bible tends to be stories about men. Uh, because that was the context, that was the society, that's how it was recorded. But we also know that men and women have been created absolutely equal in the eyes of God. Equal worth, equal value, equal purpose. And, and God works out his plans and his purposes equally through both men and women. And so the purpose of, of our series this month is really just to, to highlight just some of those women in the Bible and to see their story and to see God's story through them and to understand how God is speaking to us through these women in the Bible. Um, because God did choose to use women. And as we grapple with issues of gender-based violence, which is based or, or as a result of patriarchal attitudes in our society, it is helpful for us as, as a church to, to just look at these things and to, to just really see the plan and the place and the role that women have in, in God's plan and God's, God's economy as well. Last week, we looked at the story of Esther. And I just want to briefly recap because it's an incredible story. You know, Esther uh, is, was a young woman of, of exquisite beauty. And, and because of her beauty, she was targeted as a suitable candidate for King Xerxes' harem. She was taken into his harem where she was prepared and she was pampered for 12 months. And, and then she was presented to the king for one night. It was essentially a one night stand. Then if the king was, was happy with one of these women from his harem, he would invite her back. 
Now, as it turns out, not only did he invite Esther back, but he took her as his queen. So, so not only was Esther strikingly beautiful, but clearly she was great in bed as well. And, and that's why uh, Xerxes chose her to be his queen. Now, that was a patriarchal and hierarchical society. So, so these things were the norm. Women being taken into a harem for the king's pleasure, and, and no one questioned it. But, you know, in, in modern terms today, if we looked at that and we, and we gave words, vocabulary to those things that happened, Esther was abducted. She was sex trafficked. She was sexually groomed. And ultimately, she was raped. Esther's existence was purely for the king's pleasure. And as a woman, she was totally exploited for her beauty and her sexuality. Outside of that, she had no worth or value in the eyes of the powerful men or any of the men of the time. And so, friends, in Esther, we have the epitome of absolute weakness and powerlessness coming face to face with the epitome of absolute strength and power in the king, in Xerxes. You couldn't find a greater power gap if you tried. And we see, and this is the amazing thing, we see in the story how God uses the weak and defenseless to work out his plans and his purposes. As a young woman, unmarried, Esther is at the bottom of a hierarchical society. And it's a classic case of God's great strength being displayed in and through great weakness. You see, through Esther... God goes and, and he bends the will of the king, the most powerful man in the nation. And he uses Esther to save the Jews from genocide. Esther is a hero, but she's a young woman. She's not the fearless leader of, of an army like David. She's not strong and, and fierce and courageous like Samson. But God uses her gentleness, her femininity, her sexuality to save his people. Now, that doesn't for one moment make her exploitation okay, um, and it doesn't pardon it, but it shows us that God cares for the weak and the exploited, and that he can work in and through them with great power. And so, friends, we see that not all heroes wear masks and capes. Some of them wear dresses and skirts. And to this day, 2,500 years later, Esther is still celebrated annually in the Jewish festival of Purim. No man in the Bible has a celebration dedicated to his greatness, but Esther, this meek woman, does. And Esther is the savior of her people. And as such, she, as a woman, is a type. She's a picture of Jesus Christ, the ultimate savior of all people. Well, friends, today we move on to the story of Miriam. And uh, this story is brought to us by Jane Codrington. Now, Jane is a very good friend of mine, and our friendship goes back 22 years when she and I were first-year students together at the Baptist Theological College, as well as being friends for these many years, which included visits to Trish and I uh, when we were missionaries in Asia. Jane and I also served together for a while at Grace Point Methodist Church. Jane was also the pastor at Melrose Methodist Church for a while, and she continues to be actively engaged there. Jane is the mother of three daughters and the wife of one husband, and I'm sure that we are going to be blessed this morning as she unpacks for us the story of Miriam. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity of being able to speak to you today. I don't take the preaching of God's word lightly. And every time I'm given the opportunity to preach, I'm always um, remembering to take a moment to be grateful. As a woman preacher in 2020, it was not always so. Shall we pray together? Oh Lord God, we thank you that your word is living. We thank you for the story that we are going to have a look at today. We pray that you would speak to us. And we pray, Lord God, that these would be your words and not mine. Amen. Now today we're going to have a look at Miriam. Miriam in the Old Testament. Miriam was an activist. 
And to be clear, the definition of an activist is someone who campaigns to bring about political or social change. And I have to say that if that's the definition, I would like to be labeled an activist too. I think that's really why I'm so excited to be telling you about Miriam today. She really did have a hand to play in some of the change that came in the life of Israel. In a nutshell, Miriam listened to the voice of God. She heard his call to radical action and she took it seriously. She stood up for what she believed in and she gives us a great picture of how we can have a relationship with power. Her relationship with power is exemplary and there is much to be learned from it. She conducted herself in a dignified and rational way despite all the struggles that she faced as a slave woman in a male-dominated patriarchal world. Through what Miriam was able to do, the Jews experienced transformation in their lives. Moses was born and they were rescued from Egypt and their lives went from bitterness in Egypt to sweetness in the promised land. So let's drive straight in and get to know Miriam a little bit. We're going to do exactly what Trish and Janique did as they spoke through Eve and Esther. We're going to look at Miriam's life and her story. And then we're going to have a look at how her story fits in with God's story and make some applications. Do join me. She's a fascinating character, so be excited. Miriam is described in the Hebrew Bible as the daughter of Amram. Amram was the leader of the Jewish people in the country of Israel as they were slaves. Her mother is described as Jochebed and she's the older sister of Moses and Aaron. She was a prophetess and appears for the first time in the book of Exodus. The Torah, which we would call the first five books of the Old Testament, refers to Miriam as a prophetess. And the Talmud, which is a collection of Jewish writings uh, made up of the Mishnah and the Gemara, refer to her as one of the seven major prophets of Israel. Scripture describes her alongside Moses and Aaron as delivering the Jews from exile in Egypt. Now remember, the writers of the Old Testament wore patriarchal glasses. So the fact that Miriam is mentioned at all means that something special was about this woman. She is highly regarded. And so we read about Miriam just three times in the Old Testament. And in fact, there is another account of Miriam that is recorded in the Mishnah for us. It's almost like a backstory to Moses and the bulrushes. And I'm gonna to refer to that as the prequel. And so we're gonna look at these incidents and we're gonna look at Miriam's progression of leadership and examine her story and see clearly how she goes from being a young girl called to prophesy in a male dominated world to becoming one of three people who led the Jews out of slavery and bondage. And another key point that I want to make that I'd like you to look for as we go through this is that God does not discriminate when it comes to calling or gifting of his servants. He does not discriminate on the base of gender, race, sexuality, or socioeconomic position. So just keep that in mind as we go along. So the prequel. We learn from the Mishnah that Miriam's earliest prophecy was that her mother would bear a child who would be the person to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. You will remember that Pharaoh had given the order that all Jewish babies should be thrown into the River Nile. And to avoid the devastation of having to do this, Miriam's parents decided to separate so that they would have no more children. Miriam then, believing in the prophecy she had received, spoke to her father about this. And she told him that his decision to separate was in fact worse than the Pharaoh's decision 
and decree. Because not only was he avoiding having boy babies, girl babies too would not be born. Now being the leader of the Israelite people in Egypt, Amram had separated and set an example and many of the Jewish men had followed suit. But he heard his daughter's prophecy, his young daughter's prophecy, and he listened to the wisdom of it. And he got back with his wife. Many of the Jewish men followed and the following year Moses was born. You must imagine with me of the authority that she must have had. As a young girl speaking to her father about his choices. But she believed God had a plan for Israel. And she believed that her prophecy needed to be shared. And so this is the first time we see Miriam speaking truth to power. She calls out her father's decisions. Now, for those of you sitting out there, men in particular, how would you respond if a young girl called out your choices? I must say I was raised in a space where this would not have been acceptable. But what I love about Miriam is her style and the fact that she does this in an affirming way, providing a positive solution. And what is interesting in terms of her leadership progression is that she's given the opportunity to exercise her gifting in her home, in the context of her parents and her family, away from public scrutiny. The second time we meet Miriam is the famous Moses in the bulrushes story. We know the story well. And again, we remember that Pharaoh was looking for boy Jewish babies to kill. And so when Moses was born, he was kept hidden for three months. And when he could no longer be hidden, his mother placed him in a basket in amongst the reeds in the river. We read in Exodus chapter 2 verse 4 of an unnamed sister observing from the side. And this sister is traditionally known as Miriam. She was certain that her little baby brother would be saved somehow because she believed in the prophecy of God. And so she placed herself at a short distance away so that she could watch how things would unfold. And then something extraordinary happened. We notice that Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river to bathe. She found the basket, opened it up, and discovered a Jewish baby boy inside. She must have realized what was up, and she disregarded her father's orders by wanting to keep him and adopt him for herself. It was at that moment that Miriam then approached the princess and said to her, let me find you a nursing mother from the Jews. And that was when Miriam went and called her mum, who stepped in and was able to wean the baby and raise Moses for those first 18 months or so. So Moses was saved from the bulrushes. This is the second time we see Miriam speaking truth to power. She is a young girl speaking to royalty as a slave. Quite something. She must have been so bold, so brave, and quite outspoken. But remember, all in obedience to God's call. I just am amazed at the self assurity she must have had because she was potentially putting her entire family at risk. But she did it. And Moses was able to be raised in a Jewish home for, those first little, uh, for the first little while so that he would have the training and the culture and upbringing required to lead the people later. In terms of her progression of leadership and courage, we see that it is growing and we see that she is given opportunity to exercise her gifting now a little bit more widely. We see that it's being done in her 
local environment, if you like. The third encounter we have with Miriam is the Red Sea. And again, we all know this story, a famous Sunday school favorite. This is recorded for us in Exodus 14. And we know the story because we all remember the pictures from our picture book Bibles where the water was separated and the land was dry on the ground between the two sides of the river. We have the drama of chariots racing, of Pharaoh's army coming after the Jews. We can imagine the stress of parents gathering their kids and their stuff and all those things in tow and racing as quick as they could down to the Red Sea. There were a million or so Jews at the time. When they got to the water's edge, what were they to do? God told Moses to raise his staff, his hand over the water, and as he did so, the waters parted. Now Miriam, together with Aaron, leads that nation across the water. Because remember, Moses would have been standing on the side, holding his hands up in order to keep the waters apart. And so we see here in terms of the progression of Miriam's leadership that she is now granted the responsibility of leading the people across the water. The Bible credits all three of them, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, as leading the people through the divided waters. In Exodus chapter 15, we read a hymn. We read of Miriam's song. That's how it's headed up in my Bible. And really, this is just a spectacular hymn celebrating God, God's faithfulness and his victory in the leading of the Jewish people. The fourth time we encounter Miriam is not such a great experience. The fourth time we encounter Miriam, she is in fact in a sin situation. In Numbers 12, we have the account of Miriam and Aaron speaking ill of their brother Moses. Miriam has something to say about the fact that Moses has married a Cushite woman and she also has an opinion on the way that Moses is exercising his prophetic gift. And we understand from Jewish writing that what Miriam did was referred to as a Lashan Hara, which is a Hebrew term for derogatory speech, speech about a person which could emotionally or financially damage them. And it lowers them in the estimation of others. So after all these siblings had been through together and whether or not she was correct in her criticism of Moses, we do understand how God felt about it because we see his harsh dealing with Miriam's sin. We see that she was wrong. She was wrong in talking about Moses and she was wrong in that she didn't speak directly to him. Her sin was exactly the opposite of what her calling was. Her calling was to speak truth to power. And this sin was exactly the opposite. It was the opposite of everything she had stood for in her life. Lead us fall, and it is very sad. And we need to take a sober moment to stop as leaders and recognize that this can happen to any of us. When she sinned, God called her and Aaron to himself. And he said to her, give an account. Now she didn't duck or dodge. She stepped forward and she put her life in the hands of Almighty God. She was big enough to take responsibility for what she had done. She didn't give excuses. She didn't pass blame. She took what was coming to her. She was punished with a skin disease. And she bore that punishment 
without a complaining word, all the while knowing not how long she would be afflicted for. God takes the sin of Lashan Hara very seriously. And the fact that even today, when the Jews say their daily prayers, they have six things that they recite, six remembrances that they say after their prayers. And one of them is, remember what God did to Miriam on the way to Egypt. That's how seriously God takes this. In terms of her progression of leadership, any time a leader falls, it is sad and it is devastating. But the test of a true leader is how they pick up on the other side. And Miriam was a great leader and her response is exemplary. Let's also not forget that our forgiving God is at play as well. Now to move on to Miriam in God's story. I'm not really sure that I need to take much time to do this. And in fact, I'm not going to take much time because I can imagine that you all have a good grasp of the fact that if it had not been for Miriam, we would not have Moses. She saved his life twice. The first time when she called her parents to come together and the second time in the bulrushes. And so if it hadn't been for Moses, well, we don't know. But as they say, the rest is history. As we have gone through the incidents of meeting Miriam in the four occasions we've looked at, we have also tracked her relationship with power. We have witnessed her obedience to her call, her calling to prophesy and how she speaks truth to power, mostly through her life. And we have watched her development as a leader. We've also witnessed her response to sin, the fact that she owns up to it, and the fact that she bears the consequences. We have also seen our God at work. When God calls, We've seen through Miriam that he does not discriminate. He does not select people because of their age, their race, their sexuality, or their socioeconomic positions over anyone else. We also see how kind our God is as he prepares his servant for leadership and for what he needs her to do. He gives her the opportunity at home, then a little bit further afield, and then she's given the job of leading the Jews through the Red Sea. We've also seen how seriously God takes speaking about somebody behind their back. And we see that God places a huge emphasis on honesty and directness when it comes to relationships. And lastly, we've seen God's forgiveness at play as he still loves and nurtures and guides Miriam in her life after her sin. His love is enduring. His love is extravagant. And she is a recipient of that. Miriam was bold and courageous. She was called to radical action, to speak truth to power, and she was more than her mistakes. She left a great name and she left an enduring legacy. Miriam is one of the most important women in the Bible and is mentioned in more books of the Bible than any other woman. She's also the only woman to have her childhood, adulthood, old age, death and burial recorded in the scriptures. Friends, this is why we commemorate Women's Day and we even have, in August, Women's Month. Because in 1956, a group of disenfranchised women stood up to the injustices of the white, patriarchal National Party 
and they spoke truth to power. Women's Day and Women's Month is not a day for pink and pamper and pedicures. The fact that gender-based violence is still so prevalent in our world, and especially in South Africa, should mean that it is our task as God's people in this country to be a little bit more like Miriam. Speaking truth to power should be on all of our agendas as believers all of the time. It's not just an August thing or a 9th of August thing. And I want to challenge you as we conclude. Are you being called? Are you being aware of God's hand on your life and resisting it because you think perhaps your gender, your sexuality, your age, or your socioeconomic position is not good enough for somebody who would be a prophet or a spokesperson for God. I hope that this story shows you that God does not discriminate. And I hope that Miriam's story gives you the encouragement and the guts to step up and to step out and to possibly speak truth to power in a space that you have been placed. Friends, this story is a powerful story of a woman who was a great leader, a leader that we can look to, who was real, who sinned and recovered, but that God honored. I pray that you would allow Miriam's story to sit with you a bit, and that as you do, you would feel and know more clearly what God is asking of you. Maybe you need to be a little bit of a Miriam in your world, in your year to come. God bless you. Thank you again for this opportunity. I really hope you've enjoyed getting to know Miriam. I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Miriam, and I pray that you would go with God. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes our service this morning. Uh, a very big thank you to Jane, who put in a lot of time and effort in preparing the sermon for us. Uh, a thank you also to everyone who was part of our service this morning. I'm thinking of Megan, who did the kids talk. Uh, Kim Abraham, who did Family of the Week. Uh, Chris, for his testimony. Andrew, who prayed for the offering. And... Um, I don't know if I've left somebody out. I probably have. But then once again, thank you to the technical side of things, the team who week after week make things happen. So Steve Walker, uh, to Trish, to Janique, to Lene and the worship team. Guys, thank you so much. Have yourselves a wonderful week. Please remember to sign up for the marriage course. And if I don't see you through the week, I'll see you next Sunday. Bless you guys. Cheers. You are here. Move.
Who you are.